Good afternoon. Welcome to the 245 session. This is going to be about plants, and if you just want to make sure you're in the right room, you know, like on a flight. This is the flight to Honolulu, not to Los Angeles, you know, so. Um, anyway, um, I'm not going to reintroduce our two panelists today because I'm assuming uh, the overwhelming majority of you were here this morning, and um, so we're just going to launch into the content. I was going to say meat, but um, I know there are a lot of vegans in the audience, so. Um, and we are talking about plants, and so. Um, anyway, um, so what we're going to try to do here is to have a scintillating conversation, obviously, but um, I think we're going to start off by um, talking about uh, plant cognition and plants in general, because our two speakers here have a commonality in that Michael's book um, that came out a few years ago, The Botany of Desire, as he alluded to this morning, was really about the plant the human relationship to several plants, to four plants in particular, from the plant's perspective. And of course, Monica is doing, has done groundbreaking work in plant cognition, including the field of plant bioacoustics, which she almost single-handedly put on the map. Um, so I think that we'll start by, the first question that, that I, I want to delve into is, so we know that in the Western scientific tradition of, of you know, the last few hundred years, there's been this very hard attempt at a very hard dividing line between human consciousness and the rest of the natural world. Now, there's always been a countervailing trend in the sense that we have von Humboldt, who you mentioned, and Goethe, and, you know, uh, in antiquity, a different feeling about plants, and Montaigne, the French philosopher. So, and there's an old tradition of panpsychism, this idea that consciousness permeates the universe. But all of that's been a minority trend. So we've had it by years, of course, you know, in the last few years. We have Paul Stamets, who talks about mycelial consciousness, and Jeremy Narby, who talks about intelligence in nature. And last year, Suzanne Simard, who, uh, a, who discussed the families of trees and how trees share nutrients and so on. But by and large, the scientific community is still, as Monica knows well from her colleagues not speaking to her in the hallway, um, very strongly holding on to this view of the separation between human consciousness and the rest of the natural world. So the question I, I wonder is, do you think that your work in plant cognition and your changing perspectives about the role of plants will eventually change the concept of what it means to be human? Will we achieve a broader, more you know, uh, inclusive definition of consciousness? Or is there going to be savage resistance to that concept? And it'll be, as Niels Bohr said, which science changes one funeral at a time. So, so let's start with that, of how much you think these new, this work that you're doing and this, you know, these memes that you're spreading about plant consciousness are likely to have an effect on the, the view of what it means to be human and how much resistance will we get to that? Should I go first? Yeah, go for it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to be perfectly honest. Um, it, it's a very, I mean, I, so much of, you know, uh, patrolling the borders between our species and others is a really old and important thing humans feel the need to do. You know, you're constantly getting these definitions of we're the only species that X. And one by one, all the X's have fallen. Um, and it's remarkable to watch that process and the retreat of what is distinctive to us that we, we suddenly discover animals can do also. Um, so I think the general trend is toward recognizing more of a commonality. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about plants yet, I'm just talking about animals. Uh, a, a growing recognition that um, we're on a continuum. There's not this quantum break uh, between um, our capabilities, you know, whether it's tool making or language. You know, these were, these were big dividing lines that have fallen um, one by one. And, I, and I'm guessing others will fall as well. And it's, it's not surprising. I mean, we're part of the same world. <laughs> you know, so it, it, extracting or abstracting humanity from nature just seems to be an obsession of ours. Uh, at least in the West, 
Um, and I shouldn't generalize, but there are definitely cultures that don't have it. So I, I think people will work hard to patrol these borders. But I need to, you know, when we, when we use a word like consciousness, though, we have to be really careful. There are many, many ways to define it. And it's easy to elide them and let them kind of slip together. Consciousness can mean something as simple as awareness of one's environment. Uh, and in that definition, you can imagine, and your work has, has shown, that plants have this awareness. They're responding in ways that aren't simply rote. Um, and, uh, and then the word intelligence, too. How do you define intelligence? Um, so people bring their imagination of and there's imagination too, another word, um, to these words, and, but it's very important we agree on what they mean and what we're using. When, when you talk about human consciousness, we're usually talking about self-consciousness, a quality of re self-reflection. And I don't know that you're ready to say that about plants. Uh, I mean, I'm not, but um, uh, so we, we have to get all this you know, clear. But if you define intelligence as the ability to solve novel problems, um, yeah, plants have it. Um, but other people would define intelligence in another way. You know, Jeremy Norby was pointing out that he was studying Japanese scientists who didn't work with slime mold as being able to solve problems, and that um, people got very uncomfortable when they used the word intelligence. But if they said smartness, then it was all okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess. It, a lot is in the language, as you say. So, Monica, yeah. And actually, it's, uh, intelligence is a good one because um, the word intelligence simply means, uh, literally means choosing between. That's where the roots of the word comes from. So choosing between is a, a smart thing to do. <laughs> and, uh, and everything needs to choose between options of various kind, whether it's like, shall I go and get my water over there? Shall I uh, open my leaves? Shall I crawl and get those nuts or not? Shall I mate with this one or that one? Uh, which one is brighter? So all of these uh, choices are intelligent in a way because uh, that's what the definition of the word is. But of course, I think that, and so intelligence become loaded as much as consciousness and other terms when we appropriate that. <laughs> we colonize the words that we make and we give them a very specific definition in specific context. And when we do that, especially with words like consciousness, for example, it's true that we say, well, the definition of consciousness could be like that, you know, you're self-aware, self-conscious of who you are. But that in itself is a, it's a funny definition because first of all, it means that I will never know, I can only know my own self-awareness and I will never know really anybody else. <laughs> so it's the quintessential separa separation because I don't know what it means to be self-aware in your body, in your shoes, in your, in your roots. And also, in that sense, it also means that I will never, by definition, I'm already excluding everything else from, that def from, from being that. Like, uh, the, the conversation is closed. Because it's like, well, if I can only be aware of myself, barely, <laughs> uh, then I, I, that's it, there is nothing else to say. And so the concept, I think, fails. Because words are, um, we are using words to describe the world. And if the words are failing us, well, the world is still there. Uh, maybe we just need to choose different words or remove the loading open those words so that words are a medium to explore and, in, and investigate and learn and understand, appreciate, connect more rather than disconnect and, and be in a world of separation. So this is actually a very important uh, conversation starter because uh, it highlights exactly the problem that I see in our, at least in, in the West, but in general as a planet, the problem that I see today is like is a is a world of separation, uh, but that is also just a construction. The world is never being separate, you know, from the beginning to the end. It's never going to be like that. But if we are going to subscribe to that and we're going to use words to describe that and use our words to mark the separation, then yeah, we are creating things as we see them now, and it doesn't look very pretty to me. So. When I was writing uh, the, the article that Monica talked about, about um, called The Intelligent Plant, 
Um, being a good journalist, I went and found my skeptics, and I found all these you know, prominent botanists who, on first flush, when they heard about plant consciousness, plant intelligence, were incredibly dismissive. Um, and, and especially plant neurobiology, which was a very tendentious phrase that was used in the early days of this movement that Monica's uh, involved with. Um, but as I interviewed them, and I spent a lot of time with them, um, there was less disagreement than I thought once you started working on, well, what do we mean by intelligence? Let's see if we can get a common definition. What do we mean by consciousness or awareness? Uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of the skepticism fell away. Um, not all of it, but, but it, was, there, it was less, I thought it was really going to be a black and white, you know, uh, kind of a ping pong argument, but there was a convergence um, that, that I thought was very interesting and telling. On this point that Monica raised about separation, there is a quality of consciousness that is inescapable, inescapably separating, and that is, of course, as you suggest, the subjective feeling of being you, which science can't penetrate yet, has no way to measure. Um, we all take it on faith. And of course, we, we rely on something else you talked about this morning to overcome that, which is imagination. That's what novels help us do, right? They help us inhabit the consciousness of another. Uh, when you read something Monica's written or I've written, you're letting us occupy your consciousness to some extent, right? So we have, humans have developed ways to, to, to bridge those, those gaps, but they're real and, and curious and big mysteries. But I think we should be very careful on how we use the word consciousness uh, with regard to um, plants. Uh, I mean, I, I think if we mean awareness, I'm, I'm there totally. Uh, I think if we mean self-consciousness or uh, the, that, you know, you know, that famous essay by Thomas Nagel on consciousness, uh, what is it like to be a bat? If it is like anything to be a bat, in other words, if there's a quality to bat experience, Bats have consciousness. I don't know what is it like to be a mimosa. I don't know. I mean, that, this may be an essay in your future. <laughs> well, um, there is a lot in there. <laughs> it depends who is talking, I think. If you're asking the scientist, then I, the answer would be, I have no data to answer the question. So the question is unanswered. Not unanswerable, it's just is unanswered. Um, if you're asking uh, the person that has experienced plant at a, you know, at, in an intimate way, um, then um, you're right. There is no plant consciousness or human consciousness. There is only one consciousness and what is residing here is residing there. Um, we'll, we'll get into, I, I think what we're starting to flirt with is the subjective experience that some of us have in altered states in which plants definitely seem to be speaking, you know, but we'll, we'll save that for a little later on, we'll get to that. Um, but I think that, that the point you raised is a very interesting one about our sense of self because that's so problematic because tradition like Buddhism is telling us that we don't have a self as we think of it. So we're wrestling still with not just consciousness, but even who's having the consciousness. Um, um, anyway, the next uh, uh, subject I, I'd like to uh, address, and something you, I, I think, alluded to th this morning, Monica, is that um, this idea that there's less separation between human beings and, and the plant and the vegetal world and animals is one that is, of course, you know, in many indigenous traditions, or nearly all of them, uh, the human beings are often seen as just one, you know, species, not superior, really, but just part of an ecosystem of species that are all fairly cognitive. So I'm wondering to what extent um, you think that the scientific work you've done or the things you've researched approach that type of indigenous worldview and what might still be some of the separations between a scientific way of looking at things and a more shamanic participatory approach to to the natural world. All right. <laughs> um, actually, this is an important, there is another key word that comes up now with this, and is empathy. And, um, and is, uh, 
is a taboo word in many of the scientific environments that I have experienced uh, because it requires uh, the acknowledgement of a subjectivity and, uh, and somehow subjectivity seems to threaten the objectivity of science. And so, but then as you, what has been interesting, and this is like very recently, it's been happening, uh, I have been uh, starting to be a little bit more open about my experiences while I do my science. And, and the understanding that uh, by, the, by being there, I am part of the experiment, so I am a subject of the experimental setup as much as the plant or the animal that I'm looking at. And, uh, but that doesn't preclude, is not in conflict with the objective method of science. Science is a methodology. It's not like a, a paradigm per se. So within, I can use an objective method which is scientific, but I, I must use my subjectivity to try to even vaguely understand what is needed by the other to perform or to be comfortable or to whatever. And so what has been interesting is that whether you talk to people working in labs that are using rats for whatever experiments or uh, primates, uh, fish, uh, who knows how many other systems, and definitely uh, for myself plants, it becomes very clear that when you allow yourself to say, you know, I give names to my to my animals. When I used to work with fish, every single fish had a name. And if it wasn't a name, it was a number, but still the number is identified this individual specifically from that one over there. And then, um, and then you start to say, like, you know, I, I, I feel this and that about my fish, or I don't feel, uh, which of course, that's the subjective aspect of the human being that is doing the science. Then it's been really interesting to see how others I suddenly said, yeah, I had the similar experience with my whatever anymore or whatever they are working with. So in fact, what the, the theme that seems to emerge from this conversation is empathy. And empathy is our weapon <laughs> as scientists to actually indeed enter or have an entry point to the world and the life of the other uh, so that we can vaguely understand what, what it is that they're about and design experiments that allows us then to use an objective method to quantify things. And, um, and when, when you start talking to people, you realize that maybe there are a lot more scientists feeling this way than we are actually acknowledging. So one of the new projects that I'm gonna be involved with, with you know, some pretty amazing people working on primates and other systems is to invite openly scientists who have had these very personal and intimate encounters with the other to come forth. Let's collect these stories. You know, scientists, like any other creative endeavor, is about storytelling. You know, we tell the story in a particular way, which is a scientific way of saying, but really, it's another story. And so let's tell those stories and let's bring these animals and these plants and these lime molds and whatever else that we are working with to life, because that's the only way in which we are going to de-objectify them, decolonize them. And actually, it's going to be an, a collaboration then. It's an encounter between two. And, uh, and it's a sharing. The experiment becomes a sharing. And the method used for this sharing is uh, the objective method of science. Is that's what you choose. And as you pointed out, I think it's a very good point. Um, and as you pointed out, there's no science without imagination. Um, you have to imagine your way to the hypothesis or the experimental um, idea. But as I was listening to you, I think a lot about journalism too, which has uh, these ideals of objectivity. And it's written, if you take you know, newspaper journalism, uh, as if you can achieve a perfect objectivity. And, and it's written in this omniscient voice. And like, wait, that's a person talking. They're just, they're just pretending to be that way. <laughs> Obviously, there's a reason they decided to write about this. And we all go into stories, those of us who get to choose our stories, with strong subjective uh, reasons. But, that, but because you are subjective and you're passionate about a subject, doesn't mean you can't then follow methods of, in journalism, the equivalent of the scientific method is, is fairness, mm -hmm. right? That you would 
report against yourself. You would actually look for people who disagree with you and find the best arguments against your arguments. And, and um, so I agree that you can give up that conceit, and that's all it is, of existing above any interest, any subjectivity, um, without giving up the whole game. And that making that distinction, uh, and, it, and it really is at the beginning of the process especially, and then you leave it aside, um, I think that applies to writing as well. Um, so another I can't remember if no. this was actually the answer to your question. <laughs> well, that's all right, uh, you know. This is a leaderless, uh, you know, as Nina was saying, you know, it's a new vision of leadership, everybody's. Um, that could be chaos, though, I don't know. I, I might be afraid to open that door, I'm not sure, you know. Um, um, so a, another question I have is, do you think that this emerging broader view of, of the way humans fit into the natural world and a more expansive view of, you know, what smartness in, in plants and animals, um, will have, could have any effect on the environmental crisis we're having because it's somewhat tragic that just as we're becoming more, more and more open to this idea of the natural world as being alive, that we're destroying more and more of it. So do you think there's any way that this could, you know, that this emerging awareness could help in the environmental um, movement? Well, to the extent that you know, animal welfare and animal rights is part of the environmental movement. It has already, I, I think. I mean, there are things we, you know, think about the image of elephants in, 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 in world culture right now. Um, you know, I mean, there's still problems, but we're moving to defend elephants because of a, 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 a powerful recognition of the complexity of their consciousness and, um, uh, and that it becomes um, beyond the pale now to abuse certain animals. Uh, and even in scientific uh, quarters where people are, you know, tormenting rodents routinely, uh, there's a lot of misgiving about it and a lot of politics around it and a lot of effort to, to deal with it. So I think on the animal side, yeah, we've seen changes. Um, if you go to a more planetary scale, you know, at the same time that kind of consciousness is emerging, this sense of likeness, we're also talking a lot about the Anthropocene and the idea that we are, you know, we have a unique uh, power in nature and many people um, are coming around to the point of view that, that it's going to be human ingenuity that's going to save us from climate change. I mean, even the IPCC report was much more open to geoengineering and some, you know, pretty wild solutions that... Um, so there is a, a, a new hubris, perhaps, um, that's replacing the old hubris. <laughs> Maybe it's the same hubris, but the scale is planetary. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'd like to be more hopeful about it. Um, yeah, even with elephants, I mean, the numbers are still pretty staggering, and one of the main anti-poaching activists was just murdered in Kenya a few months. I mean, so this is definitely not a done deal. But it's a politics. Oh, it's yeah. definitely not a done deal. Yeah. And, and elephants are disappearing from zoos in this country, that, that, that idea, which in my, in my childhood, there was nothing complex about seeing an elephant in a zoo. And now it's kind of unbearable for a lot of people. Yeah, I was watching TV just flicking the dials and there was an old episode of a 77 Sunset Strip from the 60s and they were on a rhinoceros hunt in Africa. So that uh, yeah. we've come a long way on that score anyway. But, um, I'm going to use the Anthropocene as a starting point because, um, uh, well, at least in academic circle, that word is just the new, uh, the new word that you write in your grant so that they will give you some funding. <laughs> It was climate change, but now climate change has got a bad reputation, so you go for Anthropocene. And it looks like you're really serious about making changes. And um, what I don't like about that word, and I have expressly expressed that in, uh, even in academia, um, well, first of all, it just reiterates exactly the problem, you know, that it's still anthropocentric, it's still all about us. And it's like, yeah, we are part of the problem, but uh, we're not the only, you know, we, we need to demonize our own self too, because otherwise it's a guilt trip. And uh, a lot of people feel helpless in the situation with climate change because we are so guilt-ridden, which is so patriarchal, 
and still so old. It's just it's exactly the old story, just revomiting itself onto us in a in a different word. And uh, so it makes it literally. That's what I feel. I feel like it's in my gut. It's like oh yuck, bad word. Don't use that. <laughs> But, uh, but the reason why I think it's bad is because, well, first of all, it's still anthropocentric. So it still places us as before we, had, we were dominion of the world. Now we have the problem of the world. And it's always about us. And so it still forget in the picture that there is many other species <laughs> around with us. And, uh, but the other thing is, uh, from conservation psychology, we know, and these are data, uh, we know that um, when you feel... Um, when you are faced with something that is challenging you uh, and you feel maybe guilty or shame because you feel responsible for it, a little touch of guilt might put you into action and you can do something about it. And so the, it's healthy. But when the situation is uh, kind of overwhelming, and if this situation is not overwhelming yet, don't worry, it will become even more overwhelming as the time goes by if we don't do anything about it. And so the guilt and the shame become so gigantic, the weight of it pretty much like uh, immobilize, immobilize you. So guilt and shame will freeze you into the spot where you are. And this is kind of what we've been doing, or, you know, like we have been making the effort of moving forward, but it seems like we're not. And maybe we're frozen because we're looking at the situation as like, you see, we are the bad people doing all these terrible things, which partly we are. But also, and I guess it returns for me to empathy, is like uh, the key is in realizing that we are not alone. This is the human homo sapiens, self-congratulatory term for like the wise one, is growing possibly, hopefully, towards his own self-fulfilling prophecy of becoming the wise homo species. But in the meantime, he can learn a lot by connecting to other species that are all around us. And actually, just at lunchtime, I was talking to someone, and it was like, uh, you know, we are, uh, actually, it was just before lunch. It was like uh, an elder from Australia said at one point, because I was one of those that thought, oh, if nature could just get rid of us, the planet would be so much better without us, right? That one. And, uh, and what she said was, uh, well, do you know, the earth would cry whether it was a bacteria disappearing, a giraffe, a human, a plant, a bird. So it's not an hierarchical system where there is someone at the top, whether it's us or someone else's, it doesn't really matter. We are all here together in a circle. And so we are all as important as each other. The, the quickest we recognize that and the, the quicker we'll stop doing some of the activity that we are doing because our activity are just reflecting that we are totally misguided and misunderstanding our positioning in the collective. Um, the only thing I would say is that there is some truth to the idea that although a lot of other species are affected, you know, we're fucking ourselves over. Yeah. And that if we, you know, it, it really, there, there's nothing wrong with being concerned about the survival of our species, given that we've created conditions that may complicate that idea. Um, and so, you know, nature, we know there's a long history of extinctions um, and that nature would readjust to a world without us or, or a world, of, you know, seven degrees hotter. Um, whatever it is, nature will find a way. So, so we do have to look out for our own welfare and there's nothing wrong with doing that. I mean, but it's the key thing is that the recognition of that we are embedded in a in a world with other species, and um, uh, and they're ones like coral reefs, say that we're particularly dependent on, and that they're in trouble too. But um, so I, I I just think that even an enlightened self-interest would represent a huge um, gain over where we are right now in our thinking about it. But I also, as much as I agree with you that that guilt and shame can be disabling. The fact is there is, a, there is a tremendous support for change, 
tremendous activism, as May was talking about earlier, and that part of what's standing in the way is various accidents of politics and economics. The fact that we have empowered the fossil fuel industry through Citizens United and other you know, rules to actually mount a campaign against even recognizing the problem, uh, not to mention doing anything about it. So it's, I mean, there is a psychological dimension, but there's a very clear and obvious political dimension. And the fact that that politics should come along at exactly the wrong moment, where it can do so much damage, and not to mention having elected a government that's enthralled to that, those interests. Um, so I, I just think we shouldn't overlook that. Um, and that it's, uh, you know, we're talking about, yes, it's a psychological problem, it's a spiritual problem, but it's also a political and economic problem too. Yeah, I think what, um I was, you know, alluding to is the relationship between those two things, and I was wondering the extent to which the change of consciousness might or might not, you know, we had these debates in the 60s. I yeah, so. <laughs> you know, I mean, the debates in the 60s, are, oh, should you, you know, take care of your own spirituality first so that you're a better person, or should we change the institutions? And of course, it's stop, you're both right, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a dialectic. You have to change the system as you change, as you change yourself. So, um, but I was just wondering to what extent you thought that the, this emerging consciousness might affect the politics. But it's an unknowable question, you know. So I, I think we can move on. Um, so I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, so I want to now delve into much trickier territory because we've been kind of. Oh, this so yeah, this has been. So nice, and you know, we're, you know, and, but now the fact is that Monica, in your new book, um, which is, um, I think is available at the bookstore, but is coming out officially in November, right? Thus spoke the plant. Um, you, you stake out some, you uh, reveal some uh, um, things that might be very uncomfortable for your fellow scientists about your own personal experience with, with plants. Um, and Michael, this morning, you read from your own your own book of the, the part where you felt uh, the leaves watching you, you know, so, so we're, it's easy to say, oh, we have to separate plant consciousness, but at the same time, there's this lived experience that you've both had of actually engaging in some kind of, you know, whether it's real or not, whatever the word real means, I have no idea, you know, uh, the older I get, the less I know, but. Um, there are people here who might know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I want to delve into that. To what extent are these very strong subjective experiences you've both had with the plant realm, how do you reconcile that with both, you know, scientific view of the world and with staying an objective journalist and being allowed back at the New Yorker and so on? So, you know. Uh. <laughs> well, I think Monica's got a harder, harder uh, row to hoe here than I have. Um, uh, Given that you could, I mean, we'll see. I mean, you know, I was I was nervous about publishing these accounts of my own experiences and what what effect that would have on uh, my, you know, the fact that I'm a journalist. And but I mean, I, I made a journalistic case for having the experiences. I mean, I think the real issues are are legal. I mean, no, the journalistic case is how how are we going to understand this unless we send someone into the the heart of the mystery? Yeah, well, I volunteer. Uh, <laughs> So I really felt like, as I said earlier, I didn't feel I could understand this without having the experience. And then there was the more emotional side, which is um, I had this envy of the people who'd had these experiences and was curious to have it myself. So there was envy, definitely, which motivates many things in life, by the way. Uh, that's not so unusual. Um, you know, so I, I don't feel like I've, I don't feel like I've paid a price for it, um, you know, I thought I might have. Uh, I have not heard from law enforcement, um, which is... A not yet. <laughs> a, but the more time that goes by, there's a, a short statute of limitations. They are watching you. <laughs> well, it's, it's... It's crossing borders sometimes. You've got to it's, no, I did have some moments of, of fear. I mean, I had this book very carefully lawyered, and there are things I don't say, like you never learn exactly when I had these experiences, or where, what jurisdiction it was in. I mean, that was all very careful, and I took enormous, I, I took enormous care to protect my sources. I mean, I was more worried about them than me. These underground guides who shared their life stories and um, were incredibly generous and open, and I was really worried that they might be the target. Uh, and, you know, that still could happen, but um, our government is very disorganized right now, and it has its mind on other things, luckily. 
Um, but I don't, you know, I think that leaving the legal issues aside, the, the experiences are enormously useful for generating hypotheses, for um, rethinking um, kind of ossified ideas. I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about in, uh, this, this morning was the drugs are, seem particularly useful in breaking habits of thought. Um, that we tend to get stuck in paradigms in science, but in, in uh, bad patterns of thought and behavior as individuals, whether you're talking about addiction or depression or obsession or all the kind of ruminative loops that get us stuck and that stand in the way of creativity and novelty. And what the drugs appear to be good for is injecting some noise into the system of the brain, S some chaos actually. Um, that's what's on the other side of that door in a way, but it's a very productive chaos. And one of the neuroscientists that I, I um, interviewed at some length in the book, Robin Carhart Harris, who I, I strongly recommend you searching out his papers, he sees, he sees mental activity as on a, uh, a spectrum from uh, high entropy states to kind of very low entropy states, coma being the lowest. Um, and on the high entropy side, psychosis, uh, mania, things like that. And that there's a point of criticality where you want to be with just the right mix of order and chaos. And that, um, but most of us over time as we get older tend toward the more rigid way of thinking. We've, we have our algorithms for solving problems, getting through life, you know, answering questions from our kids, resolving an argument with our spouses, uh, how we handle our work, and we get stuck in that. And the, I think one of the great values, and this is how the experience of psychedelics helped me write the whole book, was that it, um, it breaks those habits down. You see them as habits. You're, you get a perspective on them you didn't have. It's a wonderful metaphor that one of, the, one of my uh, neuroscience sources said that uh, if you think of the mind as a, as a, as a hill covered in snow and, and thoughts as sleds going down that hill, over time, as you get older, you will keep ending up in the same grooves, right? The grooves will be like attractors and, they'll, and, and it'll be very hard to go down any other way. And what the psychedelics do is fill the grooves, you know, with a fresh fall of snow and suddenly you can go down any way you want. And uh, it's, a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful image, and I think it has a lot of truth to it. And so, so I think there's a, a, a tremendous um, value for creativity, for ways of knowing, but then they need to be tested. I mean, I had these insights, you know, and then I would try to test them afterwards. Um, because there's also a lot of um, uh, false ideas that come up. I mean, there's, as, as Robin says, there's a lot of fool's gold in the... Uh, in the psychedelic experience. We've all had those insights we woke with the next day and realized, oh, not so good. <laughs> the famous example that I, I think I mentioned in the book is uh, William James, who, who was very interested in just these kind of questions we're talking about, the, the great first American psychologist. Uh, and he had an experience, I forget what the substance was, it might have been nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide. And he, he, he figured out the secret of the universe and wrote it on a piece of paper. <laughs> And he read it the next morning and it said, the smell of fried onions. <laughs> Might be. Maybe it is. It just looks It's pretty so good, right? <laughs> so simple, huh? Um, yeah, one of the things that what you're saying uh, makes me think of is there's a sort of irony in that the people who probably need that um, ego dissolution and, and yeah. disturbance are older, the ones. are older people and the people who tend to do it are younger people who are more I courageous. I think that's changing. That's, I think yeah. that's really changing Perhaps, yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> but speak to your cardiologist first, right? It's like, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um, so Monica, but in your, in your book, uh, which I read um, before uh, we came out, uh, came out here, um, you... You're still talking to me, so that's uh, good. Yeah. Um, you're... Uh, you describe literally almost getting guidance and instructions... Oh, I wouldn't say instructions, but guidance um, from pl plants, from your dieta in the Amazon, helping you in your research to change to peas, for instance, right? From, um, from the work you were doing with chili peppers. And so, yeah, do you want to talk about that at all? I know it's... Uh, sure. It is in your book, so... Um, and I should just backtrack a little bit. I had I still a little bit of anxiety, too. Because, um, well, because as you know, it's a personal account, so you are right. there. 
And also, uh, yeah, because um, I don't know how my colleagues or the academia as a system is going to respond to this or react, I should say, more than respond. But, um, but it's very likely that they're either going to completely ignore and pretend that ne nothing ever happened. <laughs> that would be the, the nice case scenario. <laughs> Or um, there's going to be some serious retaliation. <laughs> and, but the point is exactly that. It's like, um, you know, sometimes those doors need to be open and we just need to have the courage to do so regardless of the consequences, the personal consequences. And for me, this book, um, I didn't write it because I thought, oh, cool, I'm going to write a book. Um, I... I brought it because uh, it was, um, yeah, I was asked to, yeah. By? <laughs> By the plants. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I didn't go down there smooth and easy and gracefully either, you know, like my, my slide on that snow patch was like full of bumps and, and, uh, and it was like, no, 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 I am not doing that, you know, you are. <laughs> and, so, and so I, when I started writing it, uh, yeah, there was like, I was going from, it was quite amazing actually, because some of the experiences are, you know, quite a few years old now and, uh, returning into the writing allowed me to return exactly in the place, exactly there. It's a little bit what you were describing this morning, like you can reconnect to it through meditation. Well, the writing, I wasn't expecting it, but the writing was bringing me exactly there. I had exactly the same emotional stuff, imagery, all of that. In the middle of the night, getting woke up, and it's like, you got to get up now and write this. It's like, oh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> and then, like, no, no, now. So you get up, and then... Some of the stuff that was coming out was actually, uh, it's almost like they were the missing link of the material that had been shared during, say, uh, visions or something, but I wrote it down in my diary, but I didn't really understand it. And then suddenly, years later, I'm getting woken up in the middle of the night, and what I'm writing, I don't know, because I'm just writing and then like can't wait to go back to bed. And, uh, and when I read it in the morning, it's like, oh, oh my God. And the dots start to connect. So what I've learned is that, and, and the book is still full of that, I think. From my perspective, there is a lot of stuff that is not clear. But I wanted to write it down as it was anyway, just because it will become clear if it's meant to be later. And I can't cut it out because I don't know what it is that I'm cutting out. And in a way, that for me is the actual scientist coming through of like, uh, I'm not going to throw away my data point just because I don't understand them. I'm not going to throw away my findings just because I don't uh, connect them with my original question. Here is what I found. And then we'll see what it means. Um. <laughs> The question of um, academia, well, if the system was uh, so upset with me when I was just uh, presenting the science, I mean, even this morning, what I presented to you that you mentioned is I, I was trying to do that experiment as a follow-up to the mimosa, uh, and, and I was going to do it with sunflowers, and it wasn't working. I mean, I had the setup that looked like it should be working. Technically speaking, it was fine, but just it wasn't working. And I, of course, I assumed, well, maybe plants simply can't do this. Okay, move on. And then when I went to the jungle, um, I was in Peru and, and during a dieta, which actually didn't involve a psychedelic plant as a ayahuasca, although, you know, I think all plants are psychedelic, really. <laughs> um, yeah, one morning I was just writing my diary and then I found myself writing down literally and drawing the design and the size of the pipe that I needed to use. And, and then one voice was very clear and was like, oh, and by the way, no sunflowers, peas. <laughs> so of course when I came back, I was like, all right, let's do it. And I did it with the peas. But it actually took me two weeks to work out that it was working. 
And for the first few weeks, I was running the experiment, and I actually got to the point of like, uh, again, this is what I mean when I'm talking about the subjective informing the, the objective method, because I, it was the subjective experience that um, inspired the, the experiment. But then the objectivity of the method was how to set it up so that it works and is scientifically collecting the data that is not biased and all of those kind of things. And, uh, and so after two weeks of doing the experiment, the experiment didn't really look like it was working. So then I had this moment, which it is described in the book, of like, a, you idiot. You thought that you went to the jungle, the plant told you, you come back and you do the, what? And then it's like, oh, come on, let's get a grip and get on with it, you know? And so I actually remember I went in the, in the lab on a Sunday. And, uh, and usually there is not many people hanging around on a Sunday in the university campus. So I'm there and I'm going in just to dismantle the entire lab. But for me, like, okay, plants cannot do this. I tried, didn't work. And then as I'm in, the, the experiment is done in a really dark room. And, uh, and so I'm sitting there in the dark, outside is sunny and warm, in my room is dark and cold, because P is like colder temperature. And, uh, and as I'm there, ready to kind of turn on the light and dismantle everything, there was a little thing, don't even know what it is, they say like, just check one more time. So I, <laughs> I did this inside the tubes where the peas were doing the little training, and and suddenly I saw something, and there was this, again, it's this moment of, which I, I still cannot explain, of like uh, something gets switched and moved. And so suddenly I was seeing what was happening, and what was happening was the peas were doing it all along, but I could not see it. And the reason why I couldn't see it, it was because my own bias from my own training and the conditioning of seeing things in a particular way, although I thought I was being open-minded. <laughs> and instead it was like, no, we are so full of bias and most of them are unconscious. So they're really dangerous because you will see the world as you want to see it and also as you've been taught to see it. Even if the solution is right in front of your nose, you won't see it because you can't. And suddenly, that shift allowed me to see my own bias and see what was there. Otherwise, what I presented to you this morning would have never happened. Now, the, the, the experience in itself was totally guided by the plants, by the plant that suggested in the first place how to run the experiment, by the plants in my lab who were actually teaching me and showing me, we can do this, you gave us the right conditions. Can you actually be open enough to see it though. And, uh, and the third thing that I learned out of that is I really deeply appreciated the human condition, and in particular, the condition where I was unable to see, and also the same place where most of my colleagues in academia are when they are saying, oh, this is not right. They are not seeing properly. I mean, usually the reaction are not about the data per se, usually the reaction is about the concept, the idea, even the fact that what, why would we even test this? And, uh, and for me, it was really useful because uh, after so many years of like uh, feeling always that I had to be defensive and always like push away from all these angry attacks, I could see why they were so scared because I opened that door. And it's very scary when someone close by opens a door that is so frightening because it's an invite for everyone else to open theirs. And so in a way, returning to the original question from before before, <laughs> I think that every one of us is doing whatever we are doing in our, our own uh, personalized version of life. And, uh, if we, that, I don't know if the message came through properly, so I'm going to take the advantage now to reiterate. But the courage of opening that door is not just a minor thing. Sometimes it's going to compromise what you think was your life. But what you find on the other side might be exactly the life that was looking for you. And it might be exactly the solution that we are all looking for as well. So courage at this time is probably the most potent weapon that we can use. 
because all the rest will fall into place, will find the, the solution, will find also the political will and the, the social condition to create that change. But unless you're prepared to, to open the door for yourself, then you can't expect that someone else should do it. Like, that, those politicians, they don't see it. Let's give them some, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, like, open your door. And it, it's very infectious. And this is why, I think, for the very reason why my colleagues in my corridors would not talk to me. Because the feeling was, like, well, if you talk to her, she might infect you with something, you know? <laughs> So don't, let's not get it to teach at the undergrads <laughs> because they might get infected by these ideas. So let's infect <laughs> everyone by being the infectiousness that is needed. <laughs> so. But the are, book is pretty crazy, so I'm just warning you. <laughs> are, are you kept away from undergrads? Is that true? They tried. All right. And do you have tenure? No. Oh, yeah. Actually, I don't even have a job officially right now. So then you don't have to worry about tenure? No. There was, there was a, a movie, I forget which movie, but it was about academic circles, and this um, one professor had accidentally killed the dean's dog, and, and then someone said, oh my god, he's going to be so and said, don't worry, I have tenure. Um, um, I, I want to explore a little more, um, you know, because in, in your telling of your story, you, you said literally the plants guided you and told you. And you raised the interesting question that these plants are not, they're a weird mix of truth serum and liar. And they, they often, I mean, psychedelics have very often boosted megalomaniacal tendencies in quite a few people I've known. Um, and who have written books and so on. I won't name names, but um, <laughs> over the decades. Um, so they're, they're trickster molecules in a way, and they're complex, and yet at times they really can seem to guide us towards really transformative, uh, powerful moments, and at other times they seem to lead people into. So I'm, the, the thing that I'd like to get at is that many of us who have some of these experiences are, when we're in it, we really feel that we're in conversation with an entity or with other entities, and it feels real, as real as talking to, to each other. And then the next morning we come back, well, wait a minute, was that a metaphor, was that my imagination? So I'd like to explore that. I don't think it's a solvable, you know, a resolvable question, but it's certainly one that's interesting to explore. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of the, I didn't talk enough about it this morning, but the, 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 the conventions of the guided psychedelic trip um, which are kind of the westernized version of the shamanic trip, um, are very important to these questions because there's, always, there's a, a, a heavy stress laid on the idea of an integration where you come back the next day usually um, or, or ideally in several sessions and work on this material. All this amazing material has come up and it's very hard to tell what it means, how it might be useful, what you should you know, what has, has t valuable teachings and what might be dross. And um, so a good guide can help you with that. Um, there's no question, though, that you mentioned this in, in leaving in some certain things you weren't sure why they were there, they weren't clear. There's some really powerful images that come out of these experiences that, and I, and I included a couple of them, that I have no idea what they mean. But... But they're a product of my mind. They're very uh, vivid to me now. I can recollect, I mean, I, I shared your experience of what happens when you write about this, that you, and we, we know why. You're activating the exact same parts of the visual cortex or whatever it was that, um, uh, that are just like visual koans that I just, you know, turn over in my head all the time. And, and, and other people, since I write it, propose meanings. I mean, there was a, there was a moment on a ayahuasca journey. Um, I was, for various reasons, it was happening during daylight. It was still daylight, or it was night, but not dark. So we were all given eye shades to put on um, and uh, to simulate darkness. And the one I was given, it was this black, it had these two black straps, and the two straps were tight, 
and I felt this, and I felt it more and more as time went on, and it gradually morphed into steel bars, and they were on my, they were encircling my head and then gradually working down my whole body, and I got into this very claustrophobic place, and, um, and then I looked down, and, and there was a little uh, plant, there was a vine, um, two leaves, and then it was gradually growing up through the, you know, winding its way up the steel cage that was trapping me was a support for it. It was making very good use of using that to get sunlight, get what it needed. And I kept thinking to myself, only animals can be caged. Plants can't be caged. Uh, and this was kind of this mantra that I kept repeating. I don't know what that was telling me, but I had a strong feeling it was telling me something important. And um, so... So the process goes on. The process can be lifetime. Um, you're, getting, um, you're getting kind of personalized metaphors. Those are very valuable things. You get them from dreams too, but they don't quite have the durability, I think, of, of psychedelic images. They, 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 you know, in, at least in my experience, the dream is always has this undertow of your ego probably pulling it back down into forgetfulness. And that doesn't happen with psychedelics. It, it stays remarkably vivid. So I think it's a process, and it's a really fascinating process. And um, I, I can't think of something that happened that I thought was completely false. Um, I mean, those dragonflies didn't really have contrails. I, I'm pretty sure that that persistence of vision when something's moving is part of what psychedelics does to our brain. Um, but in terms of a, a teaching that, that was leading me the wrong way, um, I don't. I don't think that I had one. But anyway, there's much. There's much more to be processed, and and I think that people, you know, when kids do psychedelics or when they did them, when they were just kind of fun and it was all about sensory stimulation and and kind of look what happens, look what it's like to be at a concert when you're, you know, if anyone had a really profound experience at that age and you were with your group of your friends and you saw God say or merged with the universe, what would your friends say? You know, oh, you had too many mushrooms, right? They wouldn't fold it into your life or fold it into their understanding of reality. There was a tendency, oh, that's just the drugs talking. Mm -hmm. the drugs don't talk, we talk. Or maybe, you know, a, a distributed consciousness talks. Um, but these drugs do nothing really except amplify mental processes. Well, just one thing about that, though, when you explore indigenous traditions, you know, with, with um, in the Amazon, it's a very places, different interpretation. It's a very different because, for instance, you did a dieta on Ayahuama, right? The, uh, the the tree and the flowering tree, and um, that very often in many many um, Amazonian cultures always appears as a headless man, right, or headless being, um, and people have a consistent vision when they do a dieta on this plant. So that's a pretty fascinating, very different than our experience, but you, you had that experience. Well, and actually this is, a, I think, a very important uh, distinction that should be made. It's like one thing is to um, take the, the compounds, the molecules, and ingest those or whatever. And another thing, what I'm talking about, I, the first time I drank ayahuasca, my partner at the time uh, said to me, are you crazy, you don't do drugs. So I am not, uh, you know, like, oh yeah, I've always done this and then, then it just ayahuasca came on the way and I just tried that too. No, it was like, for me, it, was, it felt very much like, uh, oh, I need to do this. Now, over time, I learned there's like, uh, still, I'm not interested at all about those molecules and, you know, I don't, I, I'm not interested, it's just I don't feel anything. The plants, though, when you are ingesting the plants, and that's why I say like psychedelics are everywhere. It's like you just had lunch, right? You drink coffee, you drink chocolate, you eat chocolate. Mm, exactly. <laughs> so it's just that we have again defined certain experiences in a particular way. But I just feel like whenever you are ingesting a plant, you are ingesting not just the chemi one chemical that might open or close certain channels in your brain and whatever story, but you are ingesting another being, and that being comes with a, an evolutionary history. Just as much as if we are prepared to talk about our own roots and our ancestors and how we should honor our past, well, why should we, we do the same with the others? So when you take a planting, you're taking all of her or his past. 
which means all of the other beings that belong to that species. So the knowledge that you receive is from the entire culture, not just from a molecule activating the brain and doing certain things. And so when I say, when I say, yeah, the plant said, or the, the you know, those interactions are uh, not, not necessarily psychedelic either. You know, I don't have to see pretty colors. Sometimes I'm just in my garden. And, uh, and if, usually if I have troubles, <laughs> like if I can't make up my mind, I'll sit in the garden. And then I often the way in which the message arrives is uh, still metaphorical. So it could be a pretty image. It's just that it's not an image. And, uh, and then it surprises me all the time. How, oh, of course, this is so simple. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but at the same time, and this, okay, sounds like a paradoxical or a contradiction, but actually the experience is not contradictory at all. So at the same time as I say, the plant in my garden said such and such, and I heard that plant talking to me, and I talked back or something. At the same time, it is also true that I was talking to me through that. Because at the end, as I said before, whatever resides here, resides there. So it's the self, no human, no plant, talking to the self. And that's all really, for me, that's all there is. And uh, the only reason why I'm speaking like this is because the experience has informed this, this part of the self that is residing here, that everything else is just exactly the same self. And, um, and once that shift happened for me, it just, uh, you know, I can, I can sit and discuss this from different perspectives, but they're all co-occurring. So uh, it is true that the plant talk, or is also tr not true, depending. Let's okay, so here. I think we're going to open it up to questions, and there are two mics uh, on each side, so if you want to line up. But um, yeah, so please go to the mics, because we're recording this. But the other thing I want to insist upon is please actually formulate short questions. Think haiku, not Tolstoy, okay? So, and I will, um, I will discipline you if you don't obey my command. Um, um, so, yes, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeffrey Smith, and I've been focused on GMOs for over two decades. So, thank you. My, my question is about uh, what studies can be used to test to see if a GMO plant responds differently than a non-GMO. I recently interviewed Dietrich Klinghart, who said that Fritz Papp years ago found that the biophotons emitted from GMOs were less and obscured and, and, and weakly compared to normal, but biophotons aren't really well understood. And now that we have CRISPR-Cas9, virtually every plant could be genetically engineered in a laboratory cheaply, introduced into the environment, replace nature, and we push, uh, we push out the products of the billions of years of evolution in one generation. So it's a very relevant question. Okay. Um. I think this is a question for Michael. Right? <laughs> well, no, I, I don't know what biophotons are, so I defer to you. Um. Well, I'm gonna be very sneaky and take the question in a totally different direction. Uh, and the direction is this. Why focusing on trying to um, show, or demonstrate something is better or worse? And why not recognize that maybe GM is just not quite right in its own right. Like, uh, from a plant perspective, why would you have the right to modify something which the aim is to actually make it as uniform as you can, right? If you're producing GM, the idea is you want to have a product that is consistent and is always going to be the same and it's going to work everywhere you put it. 
Well, that one doesn't make any sense. No, because like, and I, I actually, last time I was here, this is exactly what I talked about. Uh, is the problem is not uh, at, the, at the emotional level or at the even social level, but like pure evolutionary science. It makes no sense because nature is based and thrives on variability and diversity. And monoculture and GM technology go against the very nature of nature. And so they're bound to fail. So it's not so much whether it's, uh, oh, you know, I don't like GM, or oh, it's so cruel, or it's so whatever. Those are emotional issues, and we can all have those. But from a strictly scientific perspective, there's nothing to prove. It's already, it's already written in, the, in, in itself. It's like uh, monoculture and genetically modified organisms are not a good idea because they are, they are against what thrives in nature. That's all. Over here, first question. Hi, um, I'm a, an undergrad student studying mycology just across the bay, and I largely study um, mycoremediation, so natural processes of fungi, um, how those can be applied to, to healing our earth. And I'm wondering if moving forward, we're gonna see attempts at um, studies providing linkage between you know, the healing properties that fungi, specifically psil psilocybin mushrooms, um, you know, have in terms of the human body and the human mind and the healing that they provide in that context um, and, and linking that with, you know, the, health, the healing properties that they, they can apply to our physical ecosystem health. So is there a viable uh, parallel to be drawn between um, healing humans and humus? <laughs> that's, that's beautifully stated. I think you know the answer. Um, I got fascinated, I mean, I've always been fascinated by mushrooms, and, and you know, in the book, uh, Paul Stamets, known, who's known to all of you, is, is, uh, or most of you, was my guide to this world, and of course he's had a very lively interest in um, both microremediation and using mushrooms to heal, both uh, mentally and, um, and physically. Um, and, you know, to talk to him, to spend any time with him, is to be filled with a, a great sense of wonder about their possibilities. I've had a long history with Paul, and I, I swear half the time, you know, remember I'm a skeptical journalist and a materialist. I was like, oh, that's such bullshit. And, and then years go by, and it turns out, oh, he was right. <laughs> and I, I acknowledge this, actually, in the book. I mean... Um, you know, and his theory about uh, bees, you know, treating bees with, with extracts of mushrooms, which just published in Nature. It's an amazing paper. Um, so, I, I mean, healing is about wholeness, right? Reestablishing wholeness. I don't think there's anything mystical about the fact that mushrooms have this potential. I mean, they evolved as the, uh, you know, they're, they're more like us than plants because they're, 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 we both depend on the products of photosynthesis. They're, they break down things. They can break down complex carbon molecules, which is a lot of what we need uh, with uh, uh, microremediation. Uh, in terms of healing, you know, psilocybin, as far as we know, doesn't make psilocin uh, the chemical that we think is the, the central chemical in the, in the psychoactive effect to get people high. Um, we don't know exactly why it makes it. Um, it, but probably the fact that it hit on this biochemical miracle for reasons of its own uh, has uh, caused those particular mushrooms uh, to be multiplied and carried around the world and you know, end up way out of their original habitats. Um, but there, I mean, yeah, I think there are links. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I can articulate them. Do you want to take a stab? No, no. Okay. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, we, we know much less about fungi than we do about plants. They're much harder to study. Um, they're, you know, most of what we know about them is they're fruiting bodies. It's like the least important part of them, and they're, it's very hard to extract them from the earth to study them. I mean, you know all this if you're studying them. Um, uh, there's a lot more to be learned. And the fact that so much of what we know owes to uh, an amateur mycologist, in the best sense of the word amateur, uh, but uncredentialed, is, is remarkable, and that he's publishing papers in Nature. Um, there's so much work to be done. So I, 
I, you know, I think, you know, I greet you at the beginning of a brilliant career. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next over here. Greetings. Thank you guys both so much for your work. My name is Steven. I'm from Costa Rica. And I'm uh, just referring to plant intelligence. And we think about the Amazon with tens of thousands of species. And every one of those species has leaves and roots and flowers and billions of potential combinations. And the Banisterius copy and the, and the Shirkuna, they figured it out. Or the uh, Mimosa stilis. Or in the toad's case, the, uh, you know, the 5-EMO DMT. Is there any question the intelligence of plants, or are we just so freaking smart that like we can just analyze these things? But isn't it just so clear that the plants are telling us? I don't know how to answer that. Is it is it a question? Yeah, I mean it's a question. I mean, the what fact you, that they produce these the, the fact that they produce these chemicals. I, I don't think we should overlook the fact that you know evolution is not purposeful; it has no intent, and that amazing chemicals are produced completely by accident for other purposes, and then they, and then in our own intelligence, we discover them and use but them. But is it our intelligence or their intelligence screaming at us? Well, you know, that's a, that's a matter of perspective. Uh, you might be right, I, I don't know. And how, how, would you, how would we begin to prove that? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Follow that up, does the Earth itself have an intelligence? I'm talking about uh, James Lovelock, Gaia. Gaia. And also I find it interesting when you think about the plants and the humans, you know, we, uh, the oxygen and the carbon cycle, it seems like a symbiotic relationship. Do we all compose, you know, these entities a super organism? Is the Earth itself uh, a living entity in your opinion? Well, I mean, you know, by the kind of definition we're working with, the Gaia hypothesis um, suggests that the Earth uh, can correct for, for um, changes or perturbations in a certain range and restore an equilibrium, sort of like a thermostat. Oh, the biosphere, right? Not the biosphere, the yeah. Biosphere. And, and um, so to the extent that that's a form of problem solving, possibly, um, you know, I... When people talk about, you know, there are a lot of people making an argument for the intelligence of technology, too. Not in this crowd, but, you know, you go down the, go down the other side of the bay, and they'll tell you that there's, that there's an intelligence uh, that is evolving new technologies to take over, you know, many more functions, and that they see a kind of agency in that. Um, Kevin Kelly has written about this. And um, in both cases, I have trouble extending it past the, th the, the species that, particip that participate in natural selection. That's, that, uh, you know, that I can, I'm very comfortable with saying that, you know, in co-evolution, there is this um, development of quite remarkable relationships. But, but to extend that to inanimate things, I don't know. Um, even though you have evolutions of cultural things, like technologies. And in the case of Gaia or the biosphere, I mean, that is a biological system, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> How do you answer that question? Well, for me, first of all, it's like um, go and explore yourself and make up your own mind what it is true for you. And if it's really true and you can find something that is interesting, you know, we have example like Paul Stamets, he just believed in what he was doing. And then it turns out that he's right. So go and test. Science can come out of the ivory tower. The methods is available and, you know, anybody can really do it. And you can explore for yourself about the world and decide what it is that is true for you. And then, if you can make it in a way that become that can enter uh, an objective objective methodology to to explain what you see, uh, then maybe you can share it with everyone else, and that is ultimately like a great gift. And so, whether it's true or not, it's a it's not really a question that should be asked. <laughs> I'll, I'll be brief. I have had the great pleasure of uh, interacting with the Nay people, some of whom are here. 
some of the elders and hearing them one time say that coal is the liver of the earth. I thought it was an interesting metaphor. But coal? Look at coal, coal. But if you look at water and, they, and the filtration process, it's triple carbon filtered. That, that's the chemical structure of coal. So, I mean, it does have these kinds of properties in the earth. And I think that maybe we have, we should go into a dialogue with the scientific method and the indigenous elders as well. I mean, that, that to me just blew me away. I'd go as far beyond James Lovelock, but I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. No, definitely. I agree that the dialogue should be wide open and the conversation should be had totally. But I also think, you know, I, I, we have to be careful of like what's a metaphor and what's, a, and what's I don't want to use the word real, but what, you know, what is, you know, <laughs> but you know where I'm going. <laughs> you yeah, mean I, like I, you're, you don't have the words? <laughs> sometimes I am rendered speechless. Um, I think in the case of Gaia, I think that the, the research is pretty convincing that there's some kind of homeostatic mechanism that the biosphere plays in regulating temperature, but whether that's sentient or not is a whole other unknowable. Anyway, next question over here. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Che from the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. I study uh, cannabis and cannabinoids. And uh, I recently have uh, found out about transient receptor potential vanilloid 1, which is a cannabinoid that has an ion channel that could generate a nerve pulse. I wonder if you have any knowledge of this subject. I just, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not into the, the molecules. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said, okay. sorry. Right. Well, She's the scientist. Exactly. I, I, I'd like to suggest that both of you have a look at transient receptor potential vanilloid one. It's, I believe, this, the origin of touch, the origin of nerves, and possibly the origin of consciousness implants. Yeah, Emily. Thank you. Send us some information. Yeah, thank you. Next question over here. Hi there. Thanks a lot. Um, speaking from an artist and a designer point of view that looks at the world visually, I'm going to start with a quote from Joseph Campbell. Dreams are private myths, and myths are public dreams. My, my uh, question for you guys is, how do you explain some of the thoughts and shared visions and entities and experiences people have under these entheogens that are shared with no prior knowledge or subjected to those entities and those cultures and those even from ancient times? <clears throat> these experiences are not in their, what you say, own tribal uh, uh, ethos, but here they are having the same experience. Yeah, well, the experience of entities, which is commonly associated with DMT, is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and it's actually now being studied. Um, there are a couple of trials underway uh, looking at the phenomenology of DMT experience, which has this remarkable consistency. I don't know whether it's been tried in a true cross-cultural way with people who are completely naive. And it's very hard. You're, you're really trying to isolate uh, a, a population from a meme. Like a memory. Yeah, but or like a cultural idea. Like, you know, my guess is before Terrence McKenna started talking about entities, fewer people saw them. It's just my guess. I don't have any scientific basis for saying that. But, um, but now, lots of people see them. And so th I guess the real test would be to go to a very different culture that hasn't been exposed to this meme and see whether it's true. If it is true, there's a lot of ways you could interpret it. One is that people on DMT are actually having access to a dimension of, of consciousness or reality that is invisible to most of us most of the time. They're visiting somewhere real, and that's certainly a, um, a conviction that some people come out with. Or that the entities are some kind of Jungian archetype that's in there. I mean, we do have... Um, uh, there's commonalities of, of myth, as you suggest, and r remarkable commonalities across cultures of different kinds of stories that may well be hardwired uh, in some sense. 
Uh, or it's evidence of some kind of universal consciousness that we take part in. I mean, one of the ideas that uh, I, was, I, I got some pushback on the book that I thought was really interesting was that even though the book is kind of agnostic on that question, I, I, I disclosed that I have a strong materialist bias, um, but that there are people who emerge from their work with psychedelics with a... Uh, ideas of transpersonal consciousness, different ideas. And, and the, the, the idea that our brains may not actually produce consciousness, um, but, but funnel it, channel it, that, that we're like uh, radio receivers or TV receivers, and the same reason you wouldn't look for, um, you know, uh, the, the, the woman who delivered the weather report inside your TV set. You shouldn't look for consciousness inside your brain. Um, that's the metaphor, um, and it's only a metaphor. Um, and I think that's a very interesting idea, and there was a school of philosophy, uh, and, and William James believed something like that, uh, and, and the idea that, that our consciousness, our brains are, are limiting the amount of consciousness that comes in, uh, because it would be overwhelming, so that our brains, he called it um, the reducing valve, um, and that was kind of like the ego in that it, it limited what comes in, both from nature, from the natural world, and from your own subconscious. And, it, it, and he said, it just gives you that measly trickle of information you need to get through the day and survive and reproduce, you know, do all the things natural selection wants you to be able to do. And um, that's an interesting theory. Uh, and, but, 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 and before I dismiss that, I, you know, I learned we actually have like no evidence that brains produce consciousness. I mean, it's it's really is as the Dalai Lama said. It's a hypothesis. Um, it seems like a pretty strong one to me, but um, but it's it's we're so far from proving it. So you know, ideas of transpersonal consciousness are are um, you know I think they need to be taken seriously. I think people need to work on it. They're not. Most scientists dismiss them. You know, and they start from the assumption. And that's not what science should do. Science should test its assumptions. Um, but in the case of consciousness, it doesn't. Yeah, there's an amazing book that um, the antipodes or antipodes, depending on how you pronounce the word, of the mind um, by a cognitive scientist who interviewed hundreds of people from Peru, Brazil, the United States, who had all done ayahuasca, and he cataloged the visions they had, how many saw snakes, how many saw jaguars, how many how many saw flying saucers. It's kind of an interesting, uh, I don't think it'll answer your question, but it'll provide a lot of data to... But, I mean, there's the, also yeah. expectancy effects. I mean, it's yeah. important. You know, I hate to throw cold water on things, but the fact is, you know, ayahuasca has, is, is associated with certain kinds of imagery, vines. I had my vine imagery and, and uh, leopards and, and this kind of stuff. And, and it's, one of the amazing things about psychedelics is the extent to which... Uh, they are shaped by, as Timothy Leary memorably said, set and setting. And so if you're working with a guide who uh, believes you will... Um, well, a related phenomenon. If you work with a, a guide who has a Freudian orientation, you will have Freudian imagery in your trip, and ditto a Jungian, uh, and, and down the line. That, um, so the imagery is, is, is highly um, uh, influenced by expectation. And, and so it'd be really interesting to prove those examples that don't conform to that rule, but, um, but that's, that's always my assumption going in. All right, next question over here. This question is actually for everybody, but maybe you all could get back to me later. So for you two, for right now, since... We have microphones. <laughs> yes. Um, since animal agriculture, a.k.a. animal exploitation, is known to be a leading cause of so much cruelty, destruction, and climate change, I've seen a huge rise in the animal rights movement and people uh, encouraging a vegan plant-based diet. Do you feel it's wise that we move in that direction to eat more plants instead of animals? Since plants, although have been proven to have a consciousness, they don't have a central nervous system and can't experience pain like us animals do. Why don't you go first? First, I should disclose I'm vegan. <laughs> Thank you. And I eat my veggies, and very gratefully, I, th I give thanks to every single one of them. 
And those when they come out of my veggie patch, those they receive the most thanks because uh, I thank them as they're growing, I thank them as they pick the fruit, I thank them all the time. So I think it's a, it's a question of relating again and being aware of what you're actually eating. Uh, the question of the animal cruelty or the animal farming, really, I think it's slightly different whether plants have pain or not and all of that. I mean, like we're still discussing whether some animals can feel pain, so whatever. But the, the question of animal farming and the way in which we are farming these animals, aside from the fact that it requires a lot of vegetal material to sustain that business, so just in itself is, in, is not sustainable. Uh, aside from the, the question of cruelty, which of course is not a minor, and for me, uh, but obviously I might be biased because I don't take part in that process, for me it should stop straight away because uh, I don't feel uh, we have the right to treat anyone, animal or plant, in the way in which we are treating the animals. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to eat meat but it's the relating and the way in which you approach the process. And so if you had your own chickens and you were happy, they were happily living with you and you had this beautiful relationship and then they were you know, going to be your dinner, I have less problems with that. And I don't think that that is disrespectful, the same way as I have no problem in taking the tomato from my plant. is when the treatment is not right. And, and that is... You know, we don't even need to measure whether there is pain or not. We can see it because what, what we spoke before earlier in this conversation of empathy, we know when something is not right. So why doing it anyway? And why on earth would you put that food in your mouth? Yeah. Um, uh, I want to answer that too. I think without question we need to shift the, the diet to more of a plant-based direction and off of animals. But the number of, I mean, the reasons are, are manifold. I mean, there is the cruelty question. Um, there is the, uh, the carbon footprint of meat production. I mean, it is the, you know, either the second or third most uh, biggest part of your contribution to climate change is, is if you eat meat, is that habit. Um, there's nothing more um, substantial or immediate a meat eater can do if they want to contribute to mitigating climate change than stop eating meat or reduce eating meat. And this dairy, like, correct? And not just meat, but dairy? Dairy too, yes. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, I am not a vegetarian. Um, I, eat, I eat meat in a very picky way, which is to say I don't end up eating it very often because I only eat meat from kinds of farms that I know and that I support. I think there is a place for animals, a very limited place for animals in our agriculture. I think my experience of the most sustainable farms that I've witnessed, the ones that are really healing the earth, the ones that are sequestering the most carbon, the ones that are um, uh, closing the nutrient loop, and not having to bring in uh, nutrients to feed their plants. They have animals. Uh, and that the relationship of plants and animals, uh, with plants feeding animals and animals fertilizing plants, um, this is, you know, if you want to create your most sustainable model of a farm, you'll probably find you want some animals. And we're not going to have animals on farms unless we're going to eat them or, or drink their milk. Not necessarily. Sanctuary farms. Okay. You don't but have to I, kill them. There's no humane way to kill them. It's so like dogs. anyway, I, I think that um, there, there is a, a small place, so I'm not willing to throw out animals in agriculture, um, but I, I think without question, the way we're, this will be, re, this will be perceived as one of the great errors and uh, brutalities of our civilization, the way we're producing uh, animal protein today. Okay, this is going to be the last question because we are near the end of our time. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. This is a question for Monica, and uh, it has to do with opening doors. Um, I had a brief experience. I moved from the Bay Area down to San Diego, and I was very lonely. And um, I'm a, a tree sister. We're a global network of women trying to reforest the tropics uh, in, with a billion trees a year. And so I decided to find my first friend in a tree. And I chose a eucalyptus because uh, they're considered an invasive species. And she had been marked with a red scarlet letter to be cut down. And she was an overgiver. 
I went just to spend time with her. I wasn't an experiment, I just was lonely. And as I did that, I put my cheek up to her bark and, and, and I, I wept sometimes and I thanked her for always being there and I brought water every day. What started to happen um, as I kissed her and thanked her as my only friend, there was a greening effect and my kisses are still there and it's been two years. And what I'm wondering is what do you think your experience for opening the door even beyond subjectivity could be with longing and love? <laughs> You just opened the door. Yeah. The rest is just waiting on the other side. Yeah. Whatever it is that needs to meet you will meet you, right? It's just that when you have the expectation of what is supposed to be there and then you don't find it, you might think that you've been let down and things are not working. But how many times we hear this story, especially with love, it's like, oh, the moment I stop looking, he or she arrived in my life. Yeah, because you dropped your expectations. And um, open the door. That's all you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and the rest of the weekend. Thank you.